Well, today is April 11th, 2015. Welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You are watching us on Suburban Community Channels, Channel 15, and as a St. Paul News Network, Channel 15, live. If you're watching at any other time, we thank you for watching us, but you are not live. And uh, again, uh, with, uh, we thank all of our viewers for SPNN and for SCC for tuning in live. And then for those of you at other stations, we also thank you for watching, even though you know, you're watching during the week at times that we're not live. Anyhow, last week on our show, if you had joined us, we had covered the Blood Moon Tetrad. And we had looked at pro uh, prophecy, uh, lunar calendar. We covered a lot of interesting things. And then we wrapped it up with, uh, a, uh, with covering the Iranian uh, agreement on nuclear weaponry. Today, we're going to go in a completely different direction. Uh, first of all, um, what do you give a Civil War historian who has everything? That's what my staff is trying to figure out. In the last week, we had mentioned uh, with Christmas coming that uh, our producer wanted an elephant with the truck so we can give away the elephant to the zoo and keep the truck. Uh, our, our intern, Andrew, he wants an Academy Award that I still think he has to earn. And then uh, our friend Tim Kinley, he wants to be the supreme overlord of uh, judges. So he wants to be the one to watch over the judges. That's a little bit more than I'm able to give him. But now the staff is all trying to figure out what to get me. Because right now we have 257 shopping days left until Christmas. And so they put together you know, a meeting of the minds, and they're still trying to figure it out, especially since they know that I've done so much with the Civil War. One thing I have not really mentioned before is the fact that I have written a book called Muskets and Memories, A Modern Man's Journey Through the Civil War. And so I've had a lot of opportunity to you know, research in depth. And uh, our, my producer is saying that I need a swift kick in the patoot. And I think he's got 257 days to figure out how to do that. But in the meantime, I've written a Civil War book. I serve on the Minnesota Civil War uh, Commemoration Task Force. Done a lot on Civil War. And this is a very important week for those who are Civil War historians or just Civil War buffs, somebody who enjoys that topic. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to start off with something that happened on Thursday in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. as we seem to have no audio. There's the statue of Abraham Lincoln. Some other sites on Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The importance of Gettysburg and the overall aspect of the Civil War we covered back in November with Remembrance Day, uh, the three-day campaign and it really was a high water mark of the Confederacy. And this is in honor of the commemoration of the surrender of General Robert E. Lee to Gen uh, Lieutenant General Ulysses Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. So the bells were ringing loud and clear throughout Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It's part of the National Park Service's uh, Bells Across the Land event. See, it was on March 30th when uh, a federal advance on the Petersburg, Virginia front uh, with Federal Major General Phil Sheridan, who was at Dinwiddie Courthouse, he was ready to move again, uh, with infantry assistance against the Confederate right flank. Now keep in mind that both the Army of Northern Virginia under Confederate General uh, Robert E. Lee and the Army of the Potomac under uh, Federal Lieutenant General Ulysses Grant and uh, Major General George Gordon Meade. They had been at the Petersburg, Virginia area for 11 months. So a year-long siege, but that was the modus operandi for 
uh, General Grant. He had siege warfare that worked successfully at Fort Donaldson in Tennessee in 1862. By 1863, he had a successful siege against the city of Vicksburg and that secured the Mississippi River for the uh, federal forces. And then he was uh, in May of 1864, he was in commander in chief of all of the Union armies and he went in the field with the Army of the Potomac even though uh, Major General uh, Meade had continued on as the commander of the Army of the Potomac. He, you know, he was a direct report to Grant and they had holed up General Lee's Confederates at Petersburg with 11 months of siege warfare. So on March 30th they broke out of the siege warfare and the uh, Army of the Shenandoah under Major General Phil Sheridan had led the Federal advance and the Confederate moves by Major Generals George Pickett and Fitzhugh Lee uh, had weakened other segments of Robert E. Lee's line and then uh, by, the, um, by the 1st of April was the Battle of Five Forks, Virginia. And the United States Postal Service on Thursday had just issued their two new Civil War stamps and the Battle of Five Forks is actually featured on them. So late in the afternoon, Phil Sheridan's cavalry and the Federal Fifth Corps attacked Confederate Major General George Pickett's dug-in troops at Five Forks. As Sheridan's dismounted cavalry attacked in front, the Fifth Corps got in on the Confederate defenders' left flank and crushed them. Pickett's forces were now separated from the rest of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. The Federals sustained losses numbering around 1,000 and had captured at least 4,500 Confederates. So by this time, the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia was shrinking in size through desertions, through uh, attrition, through uh, deaths, famine, whatnot, and yet the Federal Army continued to have more reinforcements. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was at City Point, Virginia and forwarding messages to Washington on the uh, progress of the fighting at, the, at Petersburg and Five Forks. And then the next day, Sunday, April 2nd, 1865, the Confederates abandoned both Richmond and Petersburg. Uh, by 4.30 a.m., Federal troops advanced under heavy fog along the Petersburg-Virginia lines, and by 7 a.m., the drive was fully underway and was successful everywhere. The Federal Sixth Corps captured the South Side Railroad and the Confederate lines vanished along Hatcher's Run. Uh, west of Boyden Plank Road, while attempting to rally his men, Confederate Lieutenant General Ambrose Powell Hill was killed. And then only two forts, Forts Gregg and Baldwin, had held out till noon on the western part of the lines, making retreat possible only by crossing the Appomattox River. And then Confederate General Robert E. Lee was determined to hold the inner fortifications until night enabled him to withdraw. And uh, according to my notes, federal losses sustained uh, during this part of the campaign amounted to 3,189 wounded, 625 killed, and 326 missing for a total loss of 4,140 out of 63,000 engaged, while Confederates engaged approximately 18,500 with unknown losses. However, in Richmond, Virginia on the 2nd, a messenger entered St. Paul's Church while the minister gave a prayer for Confederate President Jefferson Davis. Davis left quietly and went to his office to learn of the disaster that occurred at Five Forks. By 11 o'clock that night, Davis and most of his cabinet had departed by train for Danville, Virginia. The rail stations were jammed and the streets were filled with many of the local citizens and refugees crowding the city. Inmates broke from the state prison. Local Defense Brigade was unable to keep order. Confederate government records were either sent away or burned. And as a historian, unfortunately, a lot of those were lost, which would be very valuable today. And then cotton, tobacco, and military stores were set on fire, which soon raged out of control. Richmond was falling at last. The Confederate government still existed, but it was only in transit. The war had resumed. And then Lincoln went to the front at Petersburg on the 2nd, saw some of the fighting from a distance while keeping Henry Halleck and others in Washington informed to the progress of General Grant's armies. On Monday, April 3rd, Petersburg was now occupied by federal troops. Lincoln and Grant had conferred at a private home in the city, reviewed the troops passing through the city, 
which had undergone you know, the siege for the longest time. The first flag flying over Richmond, Virginia, was an uh, American flag, was a small guidon ra raised by Major Atherton Stevens, Jr. of Massachusetts over the former capital of the Confederacy building. And then more federal troops arrived as more people, many of whom were former slaves, had swarmed into the streets of the city that was still in flames. Federal infantry playing the song, The Girl I Left Behind Me Soon Arrived, and the federal occupation of Richmond was commanded by Major General Godfrey Weitzel, who received the surrender in City Hall at 8.15 a.m. In the meantime, the Army of Northern Virginia had continued to move westward towards Amelia Courthouse, and Grant's army was in pursuit. And then a train from Richmond to Danville had moved slowly due to roadbed difficulties, but by mid-afternoon, Davis and a cabinet had arrived in Danville, where citizens had hurriedly prepared to receive their guests. Tuesday, April 4th, Lincoln had actually arrived in Richmond, he uh, transferred onto the USS Melvern, landed in Richmond on a smaller landing vessel not far from Libby Prison. And the crowds, again, mostly former slaves, had uh, surrounded him as, as he toured uh, Jefferson Davis's uh, former home. And skirmishing had occurred uh, throughout that night around the uh, Amelia Courthouse, Virginia area. So as you can see now, in that week, you know, the Confederates had left their positions and were moving up towards uh, their eventual ruin. By April 6th, as the Confederates found that they did not have food supply, uh, they were on their way to Farmville, not the game, the uh, town in Virginia, where they were looking for food. They were supposed to have supplies there. And the last major engagement between the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac had occurred at Sailor's Creek. Uh, and crossing the stream, of course, was imperative for the Army. They almost didn't do it. And at the end, with uh, 8,000 Confederate casualties, uh, Confederates who had surrendered, uh, Federals had approximately 1,100 and 80 sustained casualties. Uh, essentially, Confederates lost one third of those that had departed Amelia Courthouse that morning. Uh, General Lee, who had witnessed the engagement, exclaimed, My God, has the army been dissolved? Pretty much had by that point in time. So by that time, April 7th, Ulysses Grant, in order to avoid further bloodshed, had sent the message to General Lee uh, with the flag of truce to uh, ask for the surrender of uh, Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. The Confederate Army, meanwhile, received more punishment, even though they had repulsed the Federals in the engagement near Farmville, and had crossed the Appomattox River and continued in their retreat. And then uh, at City Point, Virginia, uh, Abraham Lincoln sent a wire to Ulysses Grant stating, General Sheridan says, if this thing is pressed, I think that Lee will surrender. Let the thing be pressed. And that's exactly what happened. Davis and his cabinet, again, were still meeting in Danville, Virginia, wondering what in the world they could do, but the situation had, uh, there, anything they could do had very little effect. So on Saturday, April 8th, that 150th anniversary would have been on Wednesday this past week. The road to Lynchburg, Virginia, which was the next goal of Lee's army, passed through the hamlets and villages of Appomattox Station, near Appomattox Courthouse. And that's when uh, an attachment, a detachment of the Army of the James blocked Lee's route to Lynchburg. And then uh, Grant was at Farmville. He had received Lee's reply from the previous day's note. Uh, and he had asked, uh, Lee had asked what terms Grant would offer. Grant offered to meet with Lee to receive the surrender, and Lee replied later in the day that he did not intend to propose surrender. Later that evening, Lee and his, uh, high, his uh, corps commanders had met. It was the last council of war, and they had discussed that uh, whether or not they should surrender or break through to Confederate General Joseph Johnston's troops in North Carolina. And what ended up happening then was that they made one last-ditch effort to go for broke, 
and that happened on the morning, it was Palm Sunday morning, April 9th, 1865. Again, at this point in time, Lee was open to the possibility of surrender, but he didn't have any intention of surrendering. And at Appomattox Station, the Confederates tried one last attempt, and that's when um, Confederate General John Gordon had initiated the attack against Sh uh, Phil Sheridan's cavalry not realizing that Federal infantry was behind the cavalry and at that point in time the Battle of Appomattox Station was a failure and Lee knew that he had to surrender. And so let's take a look now at a clip from uh, C-SPAN on their American Artifacts series showing the surrender at Appomattox. American Artifacts takes viewers to archives, museums, and historic sites around the country. Next, from our tour of Appomattox Courthouse National Historical Park in Virginia, we visit the McLean House, site of Confederate General Robert E. Lee's surrender of his Army of Northern Virginia to Union General Ulysses S. Grant. We're now inside the parlor of the home of Wilmer McLean, Appomattox County resident who moved here in the fall of 1862. General Lee and General Grant corresponded for over three days and finally, after being effectively surrounded here, General Lee wished to have a meeting with General Grant to surrender his army. Lee sent Lieutenant Colonel Charles Marshall of his staff into vi the village to find a suitable place to meet, and he encountered Wilmer McLean, and McLean offered his own home. Lee arrived here at about 1 o'clock, sat here at this marble top table. General Grant, after riding over 20 miles, arrived at about 1.30, and when he came in, he sat at the oval wooden table here. The two had met each other in the Mexican War and that was their first discussion. They talked about the Mexican War for quite a while and the conversation got quite pleasant and General Lee reminded General Grant uh, the nature of this meeting and asked General Grant to put his terms in writing. Uh, Grant sat down and set his terms in writing for General Lee. Principally the Confederate officers were going to be paroled and allowed to go home. He was going to allow the officers to keep their sidearms and personal baggage. Uh, and General Lee later requests, asks if his men can keep their horses. Grant initially says no, that that is not in the terms, but thinks about it for a minute and says that he understands that most of these men are small farmers and they could use those horses. And he will not rewrite it into the terms, but will allow the Confederate soldiers to keep their horses if they owned one. Uh, General Lee said this would have a very happy effect upon his army. The terms are read over by General Lee and given back to General Grant. General Grant calls forward Theodore Bowers of his staff to write out these terms in ink. Uh, Bowers is nervous, he botches the job and he turns it over to Ely Parker. Ely Parker is a Seneca Indian. Uh, say he had the best penmanship in the army and General Grant's staff and he actually writes out the formal terms for General Grant. General Lee's staff officer is Lieutenant Colonel Charles Marshall. He writes the acceptance letter. They exchange those letters. That's how the, the surrender is affected, the exchange of the, the letters. They both do not sign one document. Over the course of the meeting, General Grant introduces officers of his staff to General Lee. Uh, some of them General Lee knows very well, such as Seth, Seth Williams, who was Lee's adjutant when Lee was a uh, commandant at United States Military Academy at West Point. Um, another interesting aspect of General Grant's staff, there was a young captain named Robert Lincoln on his staff, and he, of course, was the son of President Abraham Lincoln, and he was here in the room. Another interesting participant in this ceremony was a or at least not, maybe not participant, but a witness to this ceremony was this rag doll uh, of Lula McLean, uh, youngest daughter Wilmer McLean. It was sitting on the horsehair couch when the officers came in and they moved it to the mantel during the meeting. After the meeting, some of the officers took the, mantel, the, the doll off the mantel and began tossing it around. Captain uh, Thomas Moore of General Philip Sheridan's staff, took the doll home with them as a war souvenir. Uh, in the 1990s, the family wanted the doll to come back to Appomattox Courthouse uh, 
and it is now on display in the Park Visitor Center. Uh, the meeting lasted about an hour and a half. Uh, it was said to be a gentleman's agreement. Uh, General Grant was very generous with the terms. In the end, when General Lee says he has nothing to feed his men, General Grant orders rations to be sent to feed Lee's army. The men shake hands. General Lee departs, uh, goes out into the yard, uh, calls for his horse traveler, and rides back to the Confederate Army, bearing the news of his surrender. And uh, program, they wanted bells all across the country to ring at 2.15 Central Time, 3.15 Eastern Time on Thursday. And if we can, let's just go right to the next uh, clip. This was taken in Maine. The bells were ringing in Maine. Now what was happening here in the Twin Cities at that time, and the reason we can't show you a St. Paul or a Minneapolis video, is that the Civil War Commemoration Task Force had put together a program at Our Lady of Lords Catholic Church in Minneapolis. Actually, it was the old St. Anthony uh, back in Civil War days. The congregation we, that we were at, I was, I was at the ceremony, uh, dates back to 1854. And we had started a presentation commemoration uh, at, on Thursday at uh, 1.50 p.m. And we had folks in the church, the National Park site, a Service, uh, John Anfinson was there. Uh, we had a representative from the U.S. Postal Service had unveiled two uh, 1860, uh, 1865 commemorative stamps. I had given a brief synopsis on what I had just gone through regarding the Appomattox campaign. Uh, former, you, uh, former Minnesota Secretary of State Mark Ritchie was there and had some remarks. And then at the stroke of 2.15 we went out to hear the bells and they failed. So we had a silent commemoration here in Minnesota. I know uh, Mankato had bells that were ringing, some other communities did. But uh, as far as the official event, the bells failed us. But it's not necessarily a bad thing because when you take a look at the fact that Minnesotans never really got the word on the surrender at Appomattox until April 13th, April 9th was pretty quiet here then as well. But the one thing I guess in concluding this segment is uh, one thing that happened in Appomattox Courthouse right after the surrender. And of course, the jubilant Union Army started throwing up some rifle and artillery volleys in celebration. But Grant had known that he did not want to have celebrations so close to the lines of the vanquished foe. And so he had instructed the artillery and the infantry barrages of the celebration to cease. That he did not want to gloat over victory. In a war that had claimed lives somewhere between 600 and 750,000 Americans, that it was time to put that chapter in our history behind us and move on to reconciliation. So we're going to actually show you one last video that, uh, regarding the surrender. And this is from Ellicott City, Maryland. It's uh, St. Paul. I mean, we are in, in the St. Paul area, right? If we don't have a St. Paul commemoration here, we need to at least show you some relationship to St. Paul. So here's St. Paul's Catholic Church in Ellicott City, Maryland. Well, St. Paul's Church was actually founded in 1838, so by the time the Civil War had even started, we were around for over a quarter of a century. We were 25 years old or so by that time, and so when the Civil War ended, about 26, 27 years into our parish's existence, uh, we were already a thriving community, starting to grow. 
our church. The basement became a Civil War hospital for a time. It served both the North and the South. Um, uh, a lot of times the uh, injured soldiers would be uh, getting off the train, whether they were prisoners of war, getting ready to go to not too far up the road to parole, to be paroled for their involvement in the in the South. Um, so, But it was either North or the South, whoever was injured would find the nearest church, which happened to be our dear St. Paul's. And so they would come up and they used the church basement at the time and they just basically convalesced there. They were cared for, uh, some parishioners, other people, uh, for the soldiers. In our church, there's... Well, anyhow, we're just going to move on from this uh, because there's more that happened. Uh, you know, uh, when on, on the 10th, actually on, on the 9th, that was also when Abraham Lincoln had moved back to Washington. He left City Point, went back to uh, Washington, uh, even though Grant had sent the wire at 4.30 p.m. To, uh, l to notify on the surrender, when uh, Lincoln had arrived uh, in early evening, news was already spreading. Bonfires sprang up as crowds jammed the streets. Uh, the Army of the Potomac, again, uh, flags waved, bands played, artillery boomed, and that, of course, was receded because of the uh, silence of respect to the fallen dead and the vanquished foe that fell over Appomattox of, after four years of war in Virginia. And we're going to try one other thing on this bell ringing. And I'm going to try to play this one off of my computer. All right, we can go ahead and proceed. Church was actually founded in 1838. So by the time the Civil War had even started, we were around for over a quarter of a century. We were 25 years old or so by that time. And so when the Civil War ended, about 26, 27 years into our parish's existence, uh, we were already a thriving community, starting to grow. Our church, the basement became a Civil War hospital for a time. It served both the North and the South. Um, uh, a lot of times the uh, injured soldiers would be uh, getting off the train, whether they were prisoners of war, getting ready to go to not too far up the road to parole, to be paroled for their involvement in the in the South. Um, so, But it was either North or the South, whoever was injured would find the nearest church, which happened to be our dear St. Paul's. And so they would come up and they used the church basement at the time, and they just basically convalesced there. They were cared for, uh, some parishioners, other people uh, would come and care for the soldiers. In our church, there's actually two uh, paint, two stained glass windows. Uh, one that is dedicated to General Wooten uh, and another that is dedicated to Admiral Wyman. Admiral Wyman was a Navy officer in the North uh, and uh, during the Civil War, actually. And then directly across from him in the church is uh, Car uh, General Wooten's uh, uh, st uh, stained glass window. And he was an artilleryman from the Confederate Army. So I always find it very interesting that inside of our church are these two stained glass windows dedicated to two very important parishioners for us, one General Wooten, the other Admiral Wyman, who were both fighting on opposite sides of the war, but under the church truth, they're brothers and brothers in the Lord, um, and uh, I always find that very interesting. Reminding ourselves that that war, one of the things that was so great about the end of it, thank God, was it brought peace and, and order and, and unity again to our country, and I, I'm always conscious of the fact that even now, still today, um, there's places even in our own country where there is still some disunity and some, some lack of, uh, of, of care for each other and how important it is to pray on this day uh, for a, a restoration of true unity in the United States of America and, and, and racial harmony and peace uh, between everyone in our, in our great country. And so uh, may we really truly live out the, the, the gift of, of peace and unity and love in our country. ...view uh, for that video, but that whole thing is to emphasize the unity. Unity. The Brotherhood of the Church, the Brotherhood of Americans, and for those who were veterans, the Brotherhood of Warriors. But that Brotherhood took on another connotation shortly thereafter. I mean, what happened on Monday, April 10th? Lincoln was serenaded several times throughout the day uh, by relieved and happy crowds in Washington. He promised to make a more formal appearance the following evening, but he did ask for one of the bands to play Dixie. Uh, then, 
That same day, Confederate General Robert E. Lee issued his last general orders, imploring the members of his former command to return to their homes, and then he bid them an affectionate farewell. Then, uh, I guess before I move on to what happened on April 11th, 150 years ago today, uh, during the Civil War, 600 to 700,000 Americans lost their lives. And I'm, of course, counting the preservation of the Union, including the Confederate casualties in this mix. Now, from today's perspective, how much is that? What does it take to get to that level of casualties? In one day, let's just eliminate the entire population of the state of Maine. That's it. We, we're down to 49 states. We lost everybody in the state of, the, the state of Maine. And can you imagine? We just had that Airbus crash in France uh, just a few uh, weeks ago. Lose four of those every day for the next four years. Four of those. That's how big the Civil War was as far as casualties. That's why people like me still study that. We don't ever want to repeat what happened 150 years ago. But we have to look back to learn those lessons. That's one of the reasons why we're talking about that today. And, and I thank you for uh, joining us here. Now, on the night of the 11th of April, 150 years ago today, probably 150 years ago around this time, because it'd be 5:30 in the uh, in the um, in Washington. Abraham Lincoln spoke to an enthusiastic crowd from a window of the White House. Now keep in mind, back then we didn't have the security that we do now. So the iron fences that are surrounding uh, the White House they were not there. You could move right on up close to the. Uh, close to the window so you could hear the president speak. He had expressed the hope for a righteous and speedy peace. And then he discussed Reconstruction, including giving the Negro the right to vote. Now Lincoln admitted the difficulties of Reconstruction and he desired that the plans be kept flexible. It was a serious and anxious speech. It was full of the future, but it was also to be his last. See, in the crowd at that speech, was an actor named John Wilkes Booth. Booth was already upset with Lincoln. Booth was you know, part of the famous Booth family. Edwin Booth uh, was his brother. Uh, Junius Brutus Booth was uh, their father. Very reputable theatrical family. And John Wilkes and Edwin had a rivalry going. And there are some people who do believe that this kind of played out into that rivalry. But while Edwin was playing to all these packed crowds throughout the North. John Wilkes had to play throughout, from the 1850s throughout the 1860s throughout the South to places like Richmond, to places like Montgomery or Birmingham, Alabama. The so places that didn't have that good of paying venues nor that many people showing up at the venues. So he had hatched this plan to kidnap Abraham Lincoln. He thought he would look like a hero you know, we have the federal government fall to its knees because they have the president. But when Booth heard that speech that was given 150 years ago today, those plans changed. Booth no longer wanted to kidnap the president. That was when he had put together the plans to assassinate the president. It was the next day or two when he had heard that Lincoln was going to be at Ford's Theater, and that's when he had really gotten everything in motion because he saw opportunity. He was a famous actor. He knew all the people at the theater, behind the scenes, uh, at the box office. He knew the owner. He actually had received his mail at the theater, using it like a post office box. So there was an opportunity. And now let's take a look at what happened next. On April 14, 1865, President Lincoln and his wife, Mary Todd, went to Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. to enjoy a play. During the play, as the president and his wife sat in a balcony seat, an actor named John Wilkes Booth snuck in... Okay, looks like we have some technical difficulty with that one as well, and I also have that on my computer, so we will be playing that from here.
Washington, D.C. to enjoy a play. During the play, as the president and his wife sat in a balcony seat, an actor named John Wilkes Booth snuck into their seating area and shot President Lincoln in the back of the head. Immediately, he was rushed across the street to a boarding house where doctors tried to save his life. But tragically, he died the next day. Federal troops searched for John Wilkes Booth. The reward for finding him was $100,000, which would be $1.54 million in these days. As the search went on, troops were able to find people that were his accomplices. Soon he was found hiding in a barn in Virginia, and there he was shot and killed. At the same time that John Wilkes Booth was assassinating President Lincoln, Louis Payne was supposed to be assassinating the Secretary of State, William H. Seward. Payne violently stabbed Seward, which caused him to lose a lot of blood, but he survived. The nation mourned the death of President Lincoln. Tens of thousands of people lined up as his casket passed through streets and on trains. President Lincoln will always be remembered for his dedication to unity and peace. He is an American hero. And now, coming up, it's going to be 150 years since the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. There are many who think that that kept us from fully reuniting as a country. He had the Reconstruction. We had federal troops occupy the South. We've had the establishment of Jim Crow laws, separate but equal. Had the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s. And we pause to think of how this country would have changed if Lincoln would have had his flexible Reconstruction policy. His prosecution of the war took in the viewpoints of all sides. He was a man who had considered how his enemies would feel as much as his countrymen. When the war started in 1861, he was fervently in favor of reunification, preservation of the Union, not so much the abolition of slaves. He did not want to see the expansion of slavery he actually supported a colonization effort. And the country of Nigeria, as we know it today, started off as an American colony in 1863. Part of that was inspired by Abraham Lincoln wanting to establish a colony for freed black men back in Africa. You can argue whether or not that policy turned out to be correct or not, but that's a debate we're going to have you know, for a long time. If Lincoln would have lived, this country would have been dramatically different. But an assassin's bullet on the 14th of April changed all of that. We're going to take a look now at another American Artifacts segment on what happened with the autopsy. Now we visit the museum in Washington, D.C. to view an exhibit to mark the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's assassination. The New York Herald Special Editions, published on April 14th and 15th, 1865, show how the news unfolded after the first Associated Press report that the president had been shot. I'm Carrie Christofferson and I'm the curator and director of collections here at the museum and we are in um, our new Lincoln exhibit called President Lincoln is Dead. This exhibit has a really sort of tight focus on seven editions of the New York Herald which was the most widely circulated newspaper of the time that were published in the 18 hours immediately following Lincoln's assassination. So it is the minute by minute story of the news as it happened as people were getting it in this country about the assassination of Lincoln. One of the ways that we help people understand sort of not just time but place is through this great map that we have on the floor in the center of the gallery because we are almost here in this building at the epicenter of things. Um, I mean, Ford's Theater is certainly the, the, the true spot of most significance for this day, but um, the museum is on the site of the National Hotel, which is the hotel where Booth stayed the night before um, he committed this horrible crime. <laughs> 
The very first edition is the 2 a.m. edition, more or less the regular edition of the New York Herald, which was a morning paper at that time. And it covers, essentially, it's the breaking news. It's the, you know, flash moment of the president's been shot. Um, interestingly enough, it uses the word assassination already in that paper because at the time, that word meant a surprise, um, violent attack on someone. It didn't necessarily mean something that resulted in death. It has come to mean that over the years, but it's sort of interesting. One of the things that I really hope people comprehend as they move through this exhibit is that they get that understanding of how people at the time were getting their news. This was really a moment in time where everything had sort of come together the complete proliferation of the telegraph. There was still this incredible squadron of reporters available because we're just coming off the war. Um, the capacity of the New York Herald to move so swiftly with the number of pressmen they had and the speed of their presses to be able to push this much news out this rapidly. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first time all seven editions of the Herald have been together since they were printed. Um, 150 years ago, and of course that um, sesquicentennial anniversary of the assassination of Lincoln is the reason for the timing of this exhibit. I mean, Lincoln always fascinates people to this day, but this year in particular is important because we mark the 150th anniversary of his assassination. The first president um, in our history to be assassinated, and it's a really important mark in time. Well, we were going to give you the uh, medical uh, view of uh, what happened on President Lincoln's assassination, but instead we just decided to jump ahead and give you the museum's uh, take. What happened when people first heard about it? How did people first heard about it? So I hope you enjoyed that segment as our producer now realizes with uh, embarrassment that he had taken things out of sequence. So now we're going to give you the American Artifacts uh, section on what happened with the uh, medical related to Lincoln's assassination. In the country. Next, we visit the National Museum of Health and Medicine, just outside Washington, D.C., to look at items related to President Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Our final stop today is an exhibit on the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and features artifacts that were collected during those hours that surgeons were treating him um, after he was shot at Ford's Theater and during uh, and after his autopsy the next day. So you might remember that uh, Abraham Lincoln is shot at Ford's Theater at about 10.30 on Friday the 14th of April, 1865. This is just a few days after Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox, effectively ending the Civil War. Uh, Lincoln is at the play and is shot uh, in the back of the head um, by John Wilkes Booth uh, in a small, uh, by a small lead bullet. And that bullet is actually on display here, and you can see it uh, in that small glass globe. The bullet was recovered the next day at an autopsy performed at the White House. In the hours though, just shortly after Lincoln is shot, um, the Surgeon General, uh, Surgeon General Joseph Barnes, responds to the President's side. Uh, this is um, at the Peterson's house, directly across the street from Ford's Theater. Barnes calls for something called a Neelaton probe, and we mounted that in the back here on display. And the idea with the probe was that it would be threaded into the wound, with the idea that depending on how far into the wound the probe uh, would go, might identify where the um, fragment or bullet was. Um, they weren't able to do so. The bullet they found later ended up being lodged behind Lincoln's right eye. Um, but the Neelaton probe was retained and eventually made its way into the museum's holdings and is part of the exhibit we have here on display. Surgeon General Barnes and Army Medical Museum staff John Woodward and um, another surgeon named Edward Curtis were uh, at the president's bedside in the hours before he died, which uh, was about 7.22 the next morning, the 15th of April, 1865. 
it was decided then that a postmortem would be performed um, very quickly and the president's body was removed to the White House and the autopsy itself was performed in a room that today is the, one of the president's dining rooms on the second floor of the residence. It's during that autopsy that the bullet is recovered. The skull uh, would have been um, removed, the top of the skull would have been removed from Lincoln's head and as the story is recounted by Dr. Curtis, uh, Dr. Curtis lifted the brain out of the skull and held it over a china bowl. And the bullet fell into the china bowl and made a tinkling sound. And according to Curtis's notes and the notes of others in the room, um, there was a, a, a pause, a moment of silence. And with that sound of the bullet in the china bowl is really the only sound um, making any noise at that exact moment. Curtis reflects on it by saying um, something to the effect of this is a, a lead ball for which uh, we can't yet measure the, um, the calamitous effect. The autopsy is completed and some s fragments of Lincoln's skull were retained um, by surgeons who assisted at the autopsy and in one case uh, some fragment uh, was stuck on some of Dr. Curtis's tools and as he was cleaning his surgical kit later that day he found a bit of Lincoln's uh, skull fragments stuck in one of the saws. We al also have on display a bit of Lincoln's hair uh, removed from the site of the wound during the autopsy. Um, several locks of hair are accounted for in the notes um, from those hours before Lincoln died and during his autopsy. Uh, these are just a few of those that were cut and given away to different people. Another object though that's on display relates again to Dr. Curtis. Uh, Edward Curtis, a surgeon on the staff of the Army Medical Museum, is the assistant at the autopsy. When he got home that night, uh, the 15th of April, uh, after the autopsy, he discovered that his undershirt sleeve shirt cuffs uh, were stained with the president's blood and uh, Mrs. Curtis cut those shirt cuffs off and they put them into an envelope which they signed and endorsed um, and this is one of those two shirt cuffs. Uh, both shirt cuffs are in the museum's holdings, just this one is on display. Uh, many of these objects had an interesting and diverse history. Um, the bullet was used as evidence at the trial of the conspirators. Um, the fragments of bone and hair were in uh, the care and holdings of others for many years and um, most were collected in the early 1950s by an Army Medical Museum uh, curator named Helen Pertle um, and have for the most part been on display at the Army Medical Museum and now the National Museum of Health and Medicine for many decades. It's important to note that 2015 will recount the will mark the 150th anniversary of the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. Now on April 21st, it was a Friday at 7 a.m., the uh, coffin was taken by honor guard to the railroad depot to the funeral car. Edwin Stanton, Gideon Wells, Hugh McCullough, John Palmer Usher, uh, Lieutenant General Ulysses Grant, and Montgomery C. Meigs left the escort at the depot and at 8 a.m. the train departed. At least 10,000 people witnessed the train's departure from Washington as it was heading back to Springfield, Illinois. And USA Today recently came out with an interesting, very short infographic just to show you the route of the train. So there's Baltimore, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, then one up to New York, and then to Albany, over to Buffalo, down to Cleveland, then Indiana, uh, Columbus, Ohio, Indianapolis, and up to Michigan City, Indiana, for a 35-minute stop, and then Chicago, and then finally arriving in Springfield, Illinois, at 9 a.m. on the morning of May 3rd. And with Lincoln's funeral train, uh, Robert Todd Lincoln, who was assigned with uh, General Grant's staff, he only went as far as Baltimore. Uh, the train also carried the body of William Wallace Lincoln, who uh, the, one of the sons of the President and Mrs. Todd Lincoln, who had uh, died in 1862. 
But Mary Todd Lincoln herself and their son Tad had both remained in Washington. They did not go back to uh, Illinois for another month. So then with those nine cars, there were 20, I believe 26 uh, Veteran Reserve Corps escorts. They were the only ones who were allowed to handle the president's body. Uh, a special song was made, a funeral march was made specifically for this occasion. And we're going to hear a Marine Corps band version of that now. including a baggage and a hearse car. Eight of the cars were provided by the chief railways over which the remains are transported. The ninth was the president's car, which had been built for use by the president and other officials. It contained a parlor, sitting room, sleeping apartments, and had been draped up in mourning and contained the coffins of Abraham and William Wallace Lincoln. Different locomotives were used on different stretches of the trip. The train was preceded 10 minutes ahead by pilot locomotive and one car to see that the track ahead was unobstructed. The Department of War designated or de de designed the route and they're the ones who declared the railroads over which the remains passed as military roads under control of Brevet Brigadier General Daniel McCallum, the director and superintendent of U.S. Military Railroads. No person was allowed to be transported on the cars except for those authorized by the War Department. The train had never moved at speeds of more than 20 miles per hour. And that was in order to avoid any accidents. Five relatives and family friends were officially appointed to accompany the funeral train. David Davis, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Lincoln's brothers-in-law, Ninian Wirt Edwards and C.M. Smith, Brigadier General John Blair Smith Todd, a cousin of Mary Todd Lincoln, and Charles Alexander Smith, the brother of C.M. Smith. An honor guard accompanied the train. This consisted of Major General David Hunter, Brevet Major General John G. Bernard, who had composed the Lincoln Funeral March, Brigadier Generals Edward Townsend, Charles Thomas Campbell, Amos B.B. Eaton, John C. Caldwell, Alfred Terry, George D. Ramsey, and Daniel McCallum, Union Navy Rear Admiral Charles Henry Davis, Captain William Rogers Taylor, and Marine Corps Major Thomas H. Field. The four accompanied the train in official capacity. Captain Charles Penn Rose as quartermaster and commissary of subsistence. Ward Hill Lamon, Lincoln's longtime bodyguard and friend, and U.S. Marshal for the District of Columbia. Dr. Charles B. Brown and Frank T. Sands, embalmer and undertaker, respectively. Governor Oliver P. Morton of Indiana, Governor John Brow of Ohio, and Governor William N. Stone of Iowa accompanied the train with their aides. Lincoln's funeral train was the first national commemoration of the president's death by rail. Lincoln was observed, mourned, and honored by the citizens of Washington, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Departed Washington, D.C., arrived at Baltimore, April 21st, 1865 at 10 a.m., left that day at 3, arrived that night in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania at 8.30, departed at 11.15 a.m. the next morning, went to Philadelphia, Lincoln Light and stayed in Independence Hall, 10.50 a.m. arrived in New York City. Over 300,000 people came to visit the President's coffin. 10.55 a.m., April 25th, Albany, New York. Arrived in Buffalo, 7 a.m., April 27th. 6.50 a.m., April 28th. 
7 a.m. Oh, that was at 6.50 a.m. in Cleveland. 7 a.m. in Columbus, Ohio, April 29th. Indianapolis, 7 a.m., April 30th. Michigan City, Indiana, 8 a.m., May 1st. Chicago arrived May 1st, 11 a.m. Finally arriving in Springfield, 9 a.m., May 3rd, 1865. Though he was not viewed in the state of New Jersey, Lincoln's funeral train passed 444 communities in seven states. Lincoln's funeral in Oak Ridge Cemetery occurred on May 4, 1865 at 1 p.m. Lincoln's coffin was opened three times since it left Washington. May 4th, 1865, it was placed in the receiving vault at Oak Ridge Cemetery. It was moved to a special temporary vault at Oak Ridge Cemetery. December 21st, 1865. September 19th, 1861, it was placed in the Lincoln tomb. And then the last time it was Open was October 9th, 1874, when it was placed in its final spot where it's on view today. Now what happened with Lincoln's funeral car? In March 8, 1911, it had burned and it destroyed. Only very few fragments are still left. But it was burned in Columbia Heights, Minnesota, when a grass fire had swept through the area in the building in which it was housed which the car was owned by Thomas Lowry of Lowry Hill and Lowry Tunnel fame. Uh, the car was destroyed. A few fragments do remain. As a matter of fact, for the question that many people had for many decades about this funeral car was, what color was it? Some people said it was maroon. Others had said it was black. And I actually have the answer. It's just going to take me a second to pull it up. Uh, Lincoln Funeral Train Mystery Solved, and that would be, color is a deep maroon, 16 parts black, and 4 parts red. Uh, what recently happened was uh, a using uh, lamps to replicate daylight, daylight I'm just trying to think. There was, there was a lab analysis. You know, the University of Arizona campus, including the Arizona State Museum, conservator Nancy Odegaard, who has experience in a high in a color matching procedure known as the Munsell color system, had looked at flakes uh, of the actual paint chips from the car, and found out that they were 16 parts black and four parts red. And unfortunately, Minnesota's legacy of the Lincoln funeral train was that this was the final resting place of that funeral car, which should have been uh, Railroad One for the President of the United States. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's show. Please join us on, uh, on Twitter and on Facebook and on YouTube. And you can watch this again on YouTube by just going to Northstar and YouTube.com, Northstar Oasis. In the meantime, we will see you next week.